Tonight we're focusing in on Zoom with Galaxy AI on the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Ah, a baby tiger. Check out his claws as he prepares to pounce on that frog. Close one, but not as close as this Zoom. We can literally count the whiskers and... Oh look, Mum's here. Good thing I'm nowhere nearby. Go wild with Galaxy AI on the new S24 Ultra and zoom in on the epic day or night. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 3. Hello, America. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. The phone number is 877-973-7425. If you want to be on the program, as always, switching things up here, confusing my team, I'm not talking about what I was going to talk about. Instead, I'm going to talk about in a big monologue, something I was going to compress down to a few minutes, but I just feel strongly about doing it here. Let me pull the curtain back a little bit. I My flagship station where I originated is uh, WSB Radio in Atlanta, Georgia. And we have slowly been growing the show nationally. I just uh, extended my uh, time at WSB by three more years through the next presidential cycle and beyond, uh, which I'm glad to do. I started in radio totally by accident in 2011, January 11th, 2011. And I, now I can't imagine doing anything else for a living. It, it's kind of weird uh, to, this is the longest job I've ever had now. Red State, uh, redstate.com, the, the site, I, I, I get credit for founding it. I started on day one, but it was actually three friends of mine, Ben Dominich, Mike Grabaski, Josh Trevino, who started Red State. They just brought me in day one, and then they needed a free lawyer to do work, and I was the guy. They put me in charge of it. And that became the longest job I, I ever had. I, I was a lawyer for six years, five years in a law firm. It's kind of cool. My office now where I am, if you watch the videos, this, the, the view behind me is out the window, uh, very similar to the view I had as a, as a lawyer in the same building. And now here I am back in this building uh, where I used to practice law. And now instead of being my law office, it's my radio uh, command center, if you will. And my fifth year in, uh, a friend of mine, Tripp, who was a lawyer, he's now a federal judge self. I don't know that he even remembers this. He came in. He said, do you know what the definition of a, well, for purposes of radio, I'll say, do you know what the definition of a dumb butt is? I said, no. And he said, you, you don't like practicing law. You like politics. Go do politics. I was running campaigns out of my office. I was flying around the country, running congressional, state, local races. Had a very good win-loss record. I was a lawyer for President Bush's re-election campaign in 2004. Uh, it, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that far more than I enjoyed practicing law. There was this thing at a law firm called a client. They tended to be annoying with messy lives, and I didn't like them. I like corporate law a lot. I, I could I could incorporate a business. I could I could do a bond in lieu of taxation. Uh, there there are major deals I got to work on doing that, and and I enjoyed that part of it, the transactional aspect. I hated trial work. I was a criminal attorney, uh, forced to be indigent criminal defense, and I I did it, but I didn't like it. Felt bad for the people who had me as a lawyer. They were all guilty, by the way. Um, they were, they all pled guilty. They, they were all guilty, but I, in any event, so I fall into this radio thing and over time, I've been more and more mindful that, uh, I've got to really conform my worldview and, and my political beliefs to what I actually believe is true at a theological level, but it's also run me into trouble because um, the show is now a national show, and it's picking up steam nationally, and it's beginning to penetrate markets where it, it's safe to talk about your faith and religion in the South, but uh, we're on in Las Vegas. We're on outside of Portland, Oregon. We're on in Springfield, Illinois. We're on in, in Montana. We're on in Arizona. Uh, we're, we're spreading across the nation. 
And one of the blowbacks that we get is, well, he's too Southern. Never mind, I grew up in Dubai and spent most of my life traveling the world before coming back to the South. Uh, but you, you get the too Southern. Or he, he's too regional. You get that. Never mind, we're on in Montana and Oregon and the like. But the thing that comes up time and time again, and it's, it's come up on my flagship station when I was just a local host, is you spend too much time talking about faith and religion. Now, I, I had a boss once who said to ignore that because – the people in charge don't like it when you do it, but the audience actually likes it. We occasionally get complaints from the audience. But we are expanding into New England, and we are expanding into the the uh, the West Coast, the, the Upper West Coast, into Washington and Oregon, and it starts to come up from radio stations that you shouldn't talk about your faith on the radio. You shouldn't talk about the stuff. The audience doesn't like it. I actually think the data disagrees with the host, but I am mindful of that, that the radio stations are uncomfortable with it, and you don't want to come off as preachy. Sometimes I admit I do. I don't want to give up doing my Good Friday show. may have to to, to uh, just just bookend it, that, that I do my Good Friday show, and otherwise... It's not a topic that comes up unless it's relevant, but it is relevant in this regard. There's a piece from Brink Lindsay out. This Cannon Center uh, is where he works. He's got his sub stack. And it, it's actually, I, let me just read you some of this. And, and this is this is what I get. Um, and why, to some degree, I, I think you still have to talk about faith to a degree. He writes... I've never subscribed to any organized religious belief system, and my faith in the supernatural ended with Santa Claus. Nevertheless, I've always possessed what I would call strong religious sentiment. I have a definite sense of the sacred, and I am open and deeply drawn to experiences of awe in its presence. I've long had the feeling that religion is a fundamental and escapable domain of human experience. We are all worshiping some god or some idols, whatever we think we're doing, and we're all taking positions on great theological controversies regardless of whether we can articulate them. So my lack of belief in any organized faith tradition is a matter of some personal ambivalence. Sometimes it's felt like liberation from superstition, especially during my cocksure younger days, but even back then. And much more so now, it also feels like loss. It feels like homelessness. Now, the point that he's getting at here, he encapsulates this privatization of religious belief. Most people, he writes, who have fallen away from organized religious life remain exuberantly credulous. As G.K. Chesterton put it, when men choose not to believe in God, they do not thereafter believe in nothing. They then become capable of believing in anything. More than four in ten Americans believe that ghosts and demons exist and that psychics are real. A third believe in reincarnation. Nearly 30% believe in astrology. In Europe, the churches may be empty, but comfortable majorities continue to profess faith in God or some higher power. So the sunny view of organized religion's retreat as humanity's intellectual advance really can't be sustained. We're not seeing the decline of supernaturalism so much as its privatization or atomization. Belief in the fantastic has escaped from its traditional repositories where it served to bind us into communities founded on a shared sense of the sacred and now exists as a disconnected jumble, accessible as a purely individual consumer choice to guide one's personal search for meaning. What the sociologist Peter Berger called the sacred canopy has shattered and fallen to earth. We pick up shards here or there on our own and in small groups, and wherever we manage to build with them is necessarily more fleeting and less inclusive than what we experienced before. I will stop reading this this wonderful piece by Brink and just put it to you this way. So I'm in my new radio office, and it is a block from a shop that has rainbow flags and statues of Buddha and Vishnu and healing crystals, representatives of all but the great monotheistic religions. There's, there's no Muhammad there. There's no Jesus. There's no Yahweh. They're the Hindu gods, 
the crystals, the rainbow flags, and the Buddhas. Very near me is a crystal shop where you can go in and you can find the crystals that help you focus. You can find the crystals that help you heal. You can find the crystals that provide you inner peace and the crystals that are going to help you uh, exercise some control over your life and give you greater impulse control. And you can find the crystals that just recharge your soul. Organized religion may be declining in the United States, but the individualistic consumer religions, people are picking and choosing what they like. It's like the people who believe that uh, Jesus of Nazareth was some great wise man, but not actually a God, as uh, C.S. Lewis famously wrote, Mere Christianity doesn't give you the choice of that. He says he was the God of all creation. He was either a nutter or he was telling the truth. But what I find so fascinating particularly in the politics of the here and now, is how people want to embrace religion without embracing religion. They want to embrace the words and the language and the idiomatic expressions. They want to feel connected in some way to something else, but they don't actually want to go to church and be with a bunch of believers. They don't actually want to believe in what any, any scripture of any religion says. What they're doing, and this is on the left and the right, it's, it's not just a phenomenon of, of the increasingly secular left, it's, it's a phenomenon of the right as well. And you see it from Portland, Oregon to Atlanta, Georgia. What you see is people are trying to embrace causes that give them a feeling of some specialty, a feeling of some divine, feeling for some cause. They get involved in a cause, and that cause becomes their religion. It's whether you call it idol worship or or you just call, call it a cause to care about. It's, we see it in politics. We see it in, in charity. We see it across the board. People are identifying with causes. And in those causes, they're putting their concern and their faith. People used to show up at a church on a Sunday and worship the God of all creation for an hour a week. And now they're showing up at a cause and they're giving their all to the cause. And then they're picking and choosing the things from the religions of the world that, that give them, them some sort of self-understanding and, and, and self-calm and self-peace and, and, and a directed focus. But that doesn't mean it's right. And here's the problem here. All of these people on the left and the right and the center who describe themselves as secular, they're not religious, they're finding things to be religious about. And the problem is, and this gets to Marjorie Taylor Greene and her call for a divorce in the country, a national divorce. We have very few foundational institutions left from left to right in which we find common ground in. It used to be church, left and right. Everybody went to church. Everybody worshiped the same God in various ways and, and people fell out of it. What do we as a nation commit ourselves to anymore? Some people go to the crystal shop and they commit themselves to the crystals. Some go to protest and they commit themselves to protest for the cause. What do we as a nation believe in? This is why you can get the rhetoric of a of a national divorce from someone like a Marjorie Taylor Greene now, and, and it can be echoed by people on the left because nobody has anything in common anymore, but more specifically, nobody knows anybody anymore. Nobody has great connection to anybody else in American society anymore except people committed to their cause. And if their cause is a cause outside the mainstream, if it's a cause that's unique to them, it's a cause that then separates them even further from the country and a sick spiral begins. And that's why I so often encourage so many people on the right and on the left to be involved in their local community, not not just in one segment of politics, but actually uh, involve your whole self in your community. Because for people who are really committed to this great national divorce, it becomes very easy for them to do it when they've walled themselves off from everybody around them except their true believers who are exactly like them and think exactly like them. But for the rest of us, life is complicated. People are complicated. People can hold multiple conflicting ideas at the same time in their head. And if you don't get out and you know these people and know your community, you, you, in addition to going off and worshiping idols, you go off and hate the rest of your country. It's far better for you to be plugged in locally in the messiness and the contrary contradictions of the life around you than it is to be so committed to your politics that you alienate yourself from the mess because life is messy 
And when your politics provide you a level of order to that mess, what you've done is your politics has become your religion. And then I might as well talk about religion because you're still worshiping something. If you own a small to medium-sized business that kept employees on payroll through COVID, you may have a big cash refund waiting for you. The employee retention credit is a tax credit of up to $26,000 per employee, and now more businesses than ever qualify. The experts at RefundsPro.com specialize in cutting through the red tape of qualifying for this government program. Most of their refunds are over $100,000. Even businesses that have received PPP funds may be eligible, and there are absolutely no fees unless you receive a refund. There's no reason not to apply. If your business experienced shutdowns, limited capacity, supply chain challenges, or even reduced revenue due to COVID, you likely qualify. RefundsPro.com has already helped hundreds of businesses, so don't lose the refund you're owed by missing the deadline. Get started today with a free five-minute questionnaire at Refunds with an S, refundspro.com. That's refunds with an S, pro.com. Hello there. Let's go to the phone, shall we? 877 973 7425. Tammy, you're going to be up next. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. I'm going to kind of preemptively say something I didn't tell your call screener. Number right. one, you didn't fall into radio. God put you there. Well, there you go. And I, you gave me the perfect segue because I moved into the home that I own now, determined to live in a a neighborhood, not a house. So I go three days a week, two doors over and have cook and bring and eat breakfast with a 95 year old World War II veteran um, who, who's VA aid gets him up, gets him dressed, gets him out. He is physically racked, but mentally amazing. And he, I turn on our local WDBO before I leave every afternoon. And we always talk about what he hears the day before. And something prompted him to tell me this morning. I heard someone on the Eric Erickson show, and I think it was a clip you played, um, that no one fears us. No one in the world fears us. China doesn't fear us. Russia doesn't fear us. And he said, what's terrifying to me is no one fears us, but we fear ourselves. Mm. I came home and got on my knees. I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I, number one, thank God that I have this person in my life. And number two, oh, heavens. That is so well said. We really, we, uh, we increasingly in this country, people, we're, we're scared of each other. We hate each other. We, we don't have tolerance for each other. That's, that's really well said. Well, well, one, thank, thank you for your kind words and for listening and for being patient with me. I know you've been on hold for a while Uh, and and thank him for his service. Uh, tell him I said hello, and that is so well said. Thank you so much for calling He's listening. Albert, we love you. (laughs) We sure do, Albert, and thank you for your service. Tammy, thank you so much. Albert, that's well said. We really do in this country just have an unbridled intolerance for each other these days. If we spend as much, uh, had as much intolerance for injustice in this country as we did for each other, we would be a, a far better place. Um, and it's kind of sad. We used to have community where we knew each other. Uh, you know, de Tocqueville wrote about how one of the things that made America unique and harder to radicalize was we had these civic events where we would all participate in civic events together. We don't really even have those anymore. And that that's we, we don't know our neighbors as much. And I, I'm really convinced more and more that uh, we would have a better country if we spent more time knowing our neighbors instead of just knowing people on Facebook who agree with everything we say. Uh, Just a heads up uh, for those of you paying attention to this, the Dow is now down about 700 points uh, and NASDAQ, I mean, everything is in a free fall right now. Uh, S&P down 75 points, NASDAQ down 257 points. Uh, Dow is, has recovered a little bit. It's only down 647. It had been down 700. Um, the people are starting to realize that the fed actually meant it. 
uh, when they said they may have to keep um, interest rates high. Uh, 877-973-7425 is the phone number. I want to go to Sharon. Welcome to the program. Sharon, how are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you? Good. I love the last caller, Cammie. That's really sweet. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for reaching out and loving your neighbors. Um, I listen to your show a lot, and it's my first time calling in, and this is the first time I've tuned in and I've heard something. Um, I really liked how, what you said about being conscious of not making politics your religion. I think you hit the nail on the head there about, like, that's, I think, a lot of issues. And the other is people, you're right, people are afraid of each other. Um, and I think it's because we're afraid of ourselves. Um, and I think that it is just really important to love ourselves. We need to make sure that we truly do love ourselves and not neglect ourselves and fill ourselves up so that we can be of service to our communities. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's all about love, right? And just like with the words we use, speak with love, be conscious of, you know, tolerant of other religions and other beliefs. People can believe what they want as long as they're not hurting anyone, right? Right. Uh, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an evangelical Christian. I, I, I think that uh, my religion is right and, and the others are wrong, but I'm not going to force myself on them. I mean, we live in a pluralistic right. society where people can, people can have their own views as long as they're not out performing human sacrifice or the like, um, hurting each other. Yeah, not hurting anyone. Don't hurt anyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, right? it, it, you know, it, but it, to one of the things you said, we, yeah, I, I do wonder how much of the loathing in the country uh, is the, the the stress we have now individually on ourselves, uh, and it, it manifests itself into distrust of other people. Um, yep, going absolutely. through COVID did something psychologically to the country. When we were in lockdown, bored and having mm-hmm. to look at ourselves in, in the mirror, and that isolation, yeah. I, I think, pushed a lot of people over the edge and, and, you know, it, it gets into, well, for example, uh, and, and you know, the, the call screener said you, 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 you also had something about crystals. I'm actually amazed yeah, was, by the what, rise yeah, in crystal I shops. To, uh, yeah. I, I, yes. I wanted to hear what you had to say about that. Cause I caught it at the end and I was never heard you talk about crystals and I like crystals. So I want to hear what you have to say about it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I so I, my wife and, and kids and I, we were in Sedona, Arizona a couple of years ago, and, and it's very spiritualistic, a lot of hippies and stuff. And there are these crystal uh-huh. shops out there, which I just kind of thought was a, a, a Sedona, Arizona thing where you go in and, oh, this crystal is going to help give you energy. Mm-hmm. This crystal is going to heal you and, and blah, blah, blah. Right. And I'm starting to see them all over the country. We have I live in a, a city yeah. of 100,000 people, and there are two crystal shops. And yeah, where are you? It, are you in Macon? I can't remember. Yes, Where do you live? In, in Macon. Yep. You're in Macon. Okay. I'm just kind of stunned at the number of people I know who are embracing who they don't believe in religion. They claim to be atheists, uh, but yeah. they're going to go embrace a magic healing crystal that when the moon is full, right. they take it outside right. and, and it gets energy. I'm like, how you you can't believe in like a crucifixion and resurrection, but you can believe that I take this crystal outside right? and hold it in the moon. You're going to get energy. I'm fascinated by the growth of that. And, and the point is, the, is really it's this, that the data shows that we as a society are far more secular than we've ever been. But that mm-hmm. doesn't really mean we've lost religion. It just manifests itself in different ways from organized mm-hmm. religion. Exactly. And um, I would go as far to say, uh, so I will say that I was raised extremely Catholic. I mean, I went through everything through confirmation. um, And from the very early age, like, I mean, as young as I can remember, I remember sitting there and seeing clearly, I was so confused because the words that I heard the priest and whoever saying did not clearly match up with the people that I saw were supposedly embodying this. Um, so that kind of like pushed me away from it. And I wonder if other people see that as well. Um, but recently I have, I've been going through a, I would call it a spiritual awakening the past, you know, eight months or so. Um, and so I would say it's not religion. I think religion is kind of like a charged word and it turns a lot of people off and pushes them away. Um, but 
it's like spirituality is, I think that there's spirituality in religion, but I mean, maybe they are the same thing, but, um, well, no, so I guess it's, it's all it's, the same thing, but different words, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, to a degree there, there is, yeah. a, there's, a, and you know, it's, it's one of those things where as, for example, organized Christian religion fades in the West, what the trend lines on the surface show is increased atheism, but actually what they, they manifest as is an increased spiritualism. And, and I use yeah. the word paganism, and I don't mean it to be uh, connotated negatively. It's, uh, it's not, yeah. in, in the vernacular, <laughs> the things that are outside of Christendom, all of the old religious beliefs to some degree creep yeah. back in. Like, for example, uh, before the West was Christian, there was this idea that, for example, uh, crystals and, and different things could held special energies. And we see that creeping back in. Now, to your point on Catholicism, mm-hmm. there's a comedian I like named Neil Brennan, and he has the stand-up line <laughs> you'll appreciate before I let you go. He said that he uh-huh. has gone through all of the phases of, of Catholicism. He got christened, he went through confirmation, he became an atheist, and then he got spiritual. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing with that with me, and I'm really glad that I got to call in, and then I stayed on hold, and I didn't chicken out, and I had this really great conversation with well, you. Well, look, I so appreciate you. you calling in. Thank you so much, Sharon. You you have a great day. Um, one of the other things, by the way, that this, this guy, Neil Brennan, he's got this uh, comedy special on Netflix uh, called Blocks. He was the co-creator of The Chappelle Show. He is very much a liberal uh, and probably one of the smartest guys in comedy. Uh, but he talks about how atheism is the height of white privilege. That it's not a coincidence that um, a lot of rich white people are atheists, more so than black people uh, in this country or Hispanic people in this country. That religion says, uh, if you believe these things, you can have this, this wonderful, everlasting, eternal life. And rich white people are like, mm, better than this? Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, he also says he finds it very funny that that the, the that white atheists are like, um, uh, he, he, I will, um, I don't believe in your God. I don't believe in religion. But uh, here's my vision chart. It, it's 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 very funny. Uh, obviously, he does it better than me. He's the professional, but I, I just it, it's 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 a fascinating dynamic uh, that is out there in the country right now, spreading. Now, uh, I, I gotta I gotta pivot because there is something I want to get to before this day is over. And this one, oh, wrong. Why is that the link? Oh gosh. Okay. Well, I can talk about this anyway without having the link because I have a great memory as long as it's not about personal stuff. <laughs> you know, I, I you know, I, I can I like read something and I can memorize it for the rest of my life. I, I don't know that I have a photographic memory, uh, but I can read something and hold on to it. And then like, where are your car keys? I got no idea. I mean, I am the guy who goes around my house with my phone in my hand looking for my phone. Uh, I, I think that's just middle age at this point. But Members of Congress, including Don Bacon, Republican from Nebraska, are uh, demanding answers from the military on how their Air Force records were released without their permission. There was an Indiana uh, Republican, a woman who was running for office, uh, and her Air Force records were released uh, about a sexual assault she experienced in the military. She did not want the information released, uh, did not authorize the release. Uh, the Air Force claimed that it was an authorized release, and only after she lost the election came out and said, our bad, our mistake, uh, nobody authorized us to release it. We've seen the IRS release tax returns for people that they shouldn't. I mean, all the way back to Lois Lerner uh, using the IRS. If, if you're on the left, I don't think you can be dismissive of this as much as some are on the left saying it's not really an issue because it is a recurring pattern now. The Defense Department under this president has released the records of Republican members of Congress and Republican presidential candidates. The IRS under this administration and the Obama administration released tax records 
of wealthy individuals against their will without permission and done in uh, ways that suggest malfeasance, not misfeasance, leaked to left-wing reporters to smear them, whether it's Elon Musk or various conservative groups. This is something that didn't happen under the Trump administration. It happened under Obama. It's happening under Biden. It is a weaponization of the bureaucracy, what so many people on the right call the deep state. It is the entrenched bureaucracy of the United States government working to undermine uh, conservatives. It has happened in the military now. It has happened in the IRS. Uh, They're also using the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, to go after people they don't like and businesses they don't like. They have weaponized the bureaucracy. There's a problem here that goes beyond partisanship. Americans need to trust that the bureaucracy of the United States is nonpartisan because then they will stop trusting it altogether on both sides of the aisle. Even when a Republican is president, the left will presume that it is right-wing machinations when something goes against their will, when the odds are it's not because the right can't purge the bureaucracy increasingly as well it becomes far more likely that Republicans will pursue a goal of allowing the president to wholesale fire the civil service. I'm on record believing the president should be able to fire the civil service. I know there are people who react viscerally against that idea, but the civil service of the executive branch works for the president of the United States. The president should be able to fire at will anyone in the civil service. And frankly, I think a Republican president of the United States should be allowed to fire any employee of the federal government in the executive branch who gave money to a Democrat running for president, because that right there suggests that person has a partisan animus against the president. We have seen the IRS, and now we've seen the Pentagon weaponized against Republicans, leaking classified or personal private records of Republicans, of conservatives, of business entities and businessmen that the left does not like, that suggests there is a partisan animus in the non partisan bureaucracy of the United States, and it must be cleaned up. If it can't be cleaned up and if these people can't control themselves, the president of the United States should be allowed to purge the civil service. When Donald Trump was president, we saw time and again leaks from inside the American bureaucracy designed to make him look bad. Whether you believe the Ukraine impeachment was legitimate or not, the fact of the matter is there were people inside the American bureaucracy that got their hands on records and weaponized it to go after Donald Trump. Whether you think they should have or not doesn't matter. It's proof positive members of the bureaucracy work to try to undermine Donald Trump. And you can take Trump out of it. You can go to the leaked tax records of various conservative entities and various businessmen. You can go to the leaked military service records of Republican members of Congress and Republican candidates. If you cannot trust the bureaucracy of the United States because of its partisanship, you ultimately cannot trust the government of the United States because the bureaucracy continues even though the presidencies change hands. And it's not a coincidence that these sorts of leaks and these uh, sorts of releases of information regularly and reliably happen against the right, not the left, even when the right's in charge of the White House. And that suggests entrenched partisanship within the bureaucracy. And the next Republican president and Republican Congress should shut it all down, fire everyone, and start over. Because if we can't have a nonpartisan bureaucracy, we can't have a bureaucracy because we can't trust that both sides won't weaponize it against each other. We've either got to have faith in the bureaucracy or no faith at all, and it changes hands every four years, and we just hold on to our hats and wait for hell to be unleashed against the side that doesn't control the White House. And that would be bad for all of us. We need, on a bipartisan level, to recognize that the partisan weaponization of the bureaucracy is a bad thing for the stability of this country. But because it so often benefits the Democrats, I don't think they're willing to do that, which means we're going to push each other over the edge on this. We're not going to have a national divorce. We're just going to have a collapse of the civic order in this country. That's going to be bad for everybody. And for all the retirees out there, you think the stock market plunging is a bad thing today? Good luck when that happens. 
It's another reason to probably put some gold in your portfolio because the gold at least will provide some stability when the stock market doesn't have it. And that's probably why you should reach out to Advantage Gold. Give them a call and let them help you understand how to use gold in your retirement planning and in your investment strategies. 800-450-2566 is their phone number. You got raging inflation. You got the crazy stock market crash today. You got hyper volatility out there, major geopolitical turmoil. Gold might be able to provide you some stability in your portfolio. Uh, Advantage Gold is TrustLink's number one highest rated gold company seven years in a row. They got the best prices, the best staff, one of the best IRA shops out there, and they're highly, highly, highly informative and educational. They answer your questions without gimmicks. If you don't believe me, call them 800-450-2566. They'll give you a free gold IRA investment kit. Tells you what you need to know. 800 450 2566 is their phone number. They answered my questions about gold and inflation and uh, volatility in the market. And, you know, there are special regulations and rules about using precious metals, uh, particularly if you want it as part of your entire retirement portfolio. They know how to navigate those issues without gimmicks. Their sales pitch is real simple. They're the most knowledgeable team, and they can put your mind at ease if you have questions. 800-450-2566. It's Advantage Gold. That's their number. Tell them I sent you. Hello there. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number is, well, who cares? Because it's the end of the show and there's not enough time for you guys to call. I'm going to take an existing phone call. How about them apples? I want to go to uh, Eddie. You're going to be up next. Welcome to the show. And uh, before you came on the air today, I listened to the speech from Joe Biden And um, it was prolific, and it was magnificent, and I doubt he wrote one word of it. But if he was trying to re-secure his re-election bid, I think he did with that speech if he was running in Poland. (laughs) Yeah, look, Um, um, here's the thing. Uh, Let's be real clear what Joe Biden is trying to do with this is he is looking leaderly. He is trying to show the Europeans that, that we're committed. He's got some goals here in Europe in that he wants to recommit federal funding um, from the Europeans, but he's got to show the Americans are engaged to get it. But also he wants to show us in this country that age is not a problem. When the White House polls Democrats, forget you and me, when the, the White House polls Democrats, the number one issue that comes up is Joe Biden's age. Joe Biden's age. That's what comes up. The result of this is they know they got to do damage control, which is why they sent him on a 10 hour train ride from Poland uh, to Ukraine. Forget the the plane ride. The train ride was 10 hours there and back. Uh, and, And he had to come across looking spry and all this. It's, it's designed to reassure the Democrats. Remember this comes after multiple stories from CNN, Politico, the New York times and others that Democrats were concerned about his age. And and that's what he's trying to do with all of this is reassure the Europeans we're in it to win it and reassure Americans, particularly Democratic Americans, that his age is not going to hinder his abilities on the campaign trail. All right. I will talk to you guys tomorrow. See you then. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.